pretty much uh, we're jumping back on into it with Mouse Sports taking the first pick here. And I guess I'll start off with my standard thing of hello, welcome, and ladies and gentlemen to a Premier League uh, presentation. And what we're going to be looking at is this rad game between Radical Online Extremists and Mouse Sports here. The ROXKIS replaced 3D Clan in our brackets based on the fact that 3D Clan had to disband after a kind of a shuffle between their teams. Uh, so in the end, what we're going to be looking at the, these two teams in this best of three series, Mouse Sports already taking game one. And now we're going to be looking to go for a second win, obviously. And uh, let's see if ROX can turn it back. But for the moment, we're having quite a speed draft going on through. So I'll let my co-caster, Vikerman, jump in in just a second. But I'm going to go through a quick speed draft of banning out the Wisp, the Keeper of Light, picking up the Dark Seer, Nature's Prophet, and Shadow Demon on Mouse Sports side. And then banning out the Bat Rider, Nyx Assassin, and picking up the Lifesteal, Lone Druid, and Storm Spirit. So this is a really, really aggressive lineup. A mobile for both teams with the Storm, Ball, Lightning, or the Nature's Prophet teleport. Uh, but as far as lanings, it's going to get a little bit weird. What do you think, man? So, I just want to note, seven of the first nine picks in this game were exactly the same as the previous game. So, while it was a fast draft, it's a pretty fast draft if you just do the exact same thing every time. So, Maus took Nature's Prophet and Shadow Demon first this time, and uh, Roxkiss actually drafted Darkseer as their first pick. This time, we have Maus taking Darkseer and their previous two, and then Lifestealer, Lone Druid, Storm Spirit. I, I like both teams' lineups. I like Storm Spirit in the mid for Sharfdeck. I think it's a hero he's more comfortable with. We've seen him play it like three or four times already at the professional level including against teams like Liquid. So he's definitely comfortable with the Storm Spirit, maybe a little more comfortable than he was with the Magnus. And meanwhile, Mao is going with just a very similar lineup as the last time, that high mobility. They could still take the Queen of Pain. She's not banned, so if they wanted to go for a very similar lineup, that's still in the cards for them. Plus the Nature's Prophet. Kush Club played amazingly on Nature's Prophet last game, getting tons of farm, really contributing a critical Orchid purchase. So he could be a very useful asset to them there. And of course, Shadow Demon, one of the few heroes that really can stand toe-to- -to like, not toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Lifestealer but actually has tools that are strong up against the Life Stealer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this will be pretty interesting here. The Shadow Demon, of course, having a lot of kite potential. And uh, it's also going to have Life Stealer going for uh, generally a more defensive play style. He's going to go for a Quelling Blade early, and uh, that's going to allow him to maneuver up against the Nature's Profit nicely. But it also means he's going to have to uh, focus a little bit more on farm rather than uh, maybe going for an aggressive try or something like that. So most likely we're definitely going to be seeing this Lone Druid offlane. The Storm Spirit uh, mid is actually one of Sharfik's signature heroes here. So going to be very, very interesting to see how he plays that and picks that up a Aggressively. We also see the Rubik to support up against that Vengeful Spirit. So, so many picks just like before. Yeah. But I do not think this is going to be an exact rematch. Storm Spirit is much more Sharfix style yeah. than that Magnus selection goes. And although there were a couple of uh, questionary, uh, like Shockwaves and things along those lines here, Storm Spirit doesn't have to worry about those big pickoffs that kept on happening. Of course, Orchids will still be very popular amongst the Nature's Prophet and potentially Queen of Pain. Uh, or actually, not in this situation, but because um, they yeah, pick up the Darkseer for themselves. But uh, right. now, at least for the Prophet, they're going to be looking for the Orchid to try to shut down the Storm Spirit. Uh, but we'll have to see uh, if they can actually truly lock him down because he is just so good at balling, uh, literally balling out of control. He's all over the place, <laughs> just dishing out a ton of damage and uh, disables and not really able to be locked down. He, especially now that the Adventure Spirit's been picked up, that stun is disjointable, avoidable, just by uh, making sure you dodge the projectile of it. And from there, if they don't get something with a hex, which they won't because they're looking for a carry, they're not going to have that great of a time. But going for the PL, all four yeah. black, great counter to Storm by Mana Burning, but it will be difficult to stay on target you can get picked off at such long range. Yeah, I, I, I like Roxkiss's lineup definitely more this game than I liked him last game. I, I think they have a good plan. I'm not actually sure how effective the PL is going to be relatively. I mean, they don't have the Keeper of the Light. They do have Shadow Demon and Darkseer on their side, so that's more illusions that they can generate of Phantom Lancer with Disruption, which is very good, and no illusion generators on Roxkiss, which is typically the Phantom Lancer counter. In fact, this uh, matchup doesn't look that different from something we saw at the G League recently, which is one team drafts up the, the Coddle, and the other team has a dual core of the Lifestealer and the Lone Druid. So the question will be, can Dread and Business Perfect get farm and manage to bring that Phantom Lancer down, especially in sustained engagements? Whereas Black, obviously, we've talked about him as being one of the best farmers in the Western scene. We're extremely good at actually getting up the farm, which on Phantom Lancer is critical, especially early on. Yeah. He's definitely going to be able to do a lot there as well. Yeah. There's a couple things to definitely note for Roxkiss and their kind of positioning here for their roster and their, their lane situation here. Uh, we are looking at Dread going on the off lane, something that uh, as a flexible uh, player, I believe he's fully capable of, but not really used to. He used to play support for 3D Clan, and uh, in that sense, it's something, it's kind of like you get riding a bike. You have to get back 
back on and just start pedaling because I really think that he's capable of surviving and uh, manipulating the creep wave and doing all these other great things to make that lone druid pick worth it. Uh, but it's something that he has only been practicing for maybe a week or so and I definitely has to get on the ball with. The other thing to note about their roster lineup is they're not playing with a stand-in any longer. Hardeef has come in uh, on the Rubik here to support up very, very nicely. But it looks like despite what I was talking about with that Quilling Blade, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, Ideology, nice not, yeah, just with that disposition there, it's pretty much we're still seeing the aggressive trial lane. Business perfect, right. hard eve, and. Uh Yol are going to be going up top here and trying to put the pressure out, making sure the PL uh, does not get the farm he needs to, and that's understandable. I like this. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think the aggressive Tron is very, very smart. A, it, Lone Druid, while he's a very good offlaner, like you said, Dread might, since he just transitioned over from playing 5 for 3D to playing 3 for Rock's Kiss, it might be a little difficult for him in that tri lane. Secondly, this this positions them very well against PL. Shadow Demon Venge Phantom Lancer is not actually going to do that well against Rubik, uh, Lashrak, and Lifestealer. I mean, they're going to be in a lot of trouble every time that this stun combo comes out from Rubik and Lashrak. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the question is, how defensive can this uh, defensive trial lane here be? With Vengeful Spirit and with Shadow Demon, I've already mentioned how they can be uh, very, very good for setting up big damage output. So Phantom Lancer does get to level 3, has a uh, big burst with the Soul Catcher active, and then we have a bunch of physical damage coming out from his right clicks, the Disruption Illusions, and the Vengeful Spirit's wave. I definitely think it'll add up pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. in turn, we do see uh, Business Perfect uh, having a lot of potential himself. If you follow up Definitely. a telekinesis with a splitter, that's a two full second stun on top of a, a 1.5 to start off. It's just going to make it so that there's so much disable that PL is going to be on the defensive most of those mm -hmm. times, and you're not right-clicking away, you're not benefiting from those two supports. Right. If Mouths go late, I think they'll feel good. But here's my issue, and here's what worries me about Mouse's lineup. Can you name one lane in which they're likely to win? They certainly could win, but I don't know that there's a lane where they're most likely going to win. Nature's Prophet against Storm Spirit, Darkseer against Lone Druid. These are all lanes that I think that the Radiant have a slight or better advantage in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to come down to a lot about these pulls. Uh, Paz is starting off right off the bat trying to go for uh, some pulling action single pull, so it's not going to stack up and it's not going to deny the full creep wave, but if they're good with this second uh, chain up, they might be able to deny the whole wave. Either way, uh, trying to actually control the pace of it by controlling the creep equilibrium and forcing it back underneath the tower, if they can just deny the life sealer farm uh, and, like you said, move in towards the late game more so, they're going to be in a pretty good position either way, but as Sharfik plays so aggressively, once he gets uh, that bottle up, he's going to be in a great position. Now we do see up top, actually starting off this uh, disruption, here comes the teleport from the Nature's Prophet, going in for a 4 versus 3. Now PS doing a lot of damage to Harvey. He's a focused target. He won't Ooh, get enough damage though, switching over to Biz. He did pop off that Opal Wounds, means he has no rage, and that's a great op- Oh, that wow. split Earth! That split Earth. Really good disengage from Yol, setting it up on all three, and Biz will walk away very nicely. I like their switch. As soon as the Opal Wounds came out, they're like, okay, he doesn't have rage, hit the life still the hard, but but it just didn't cut it in the end with that counteraction. I mean, you add up all those heroes getting hit, and that's a six-second stun, essentially. Right. I mean, huge, huge split earth. But Lifestealer was dead, and the downside of the open wounds first Lifestealer is you have a better shot of getting first blood, but you also have a better shot of being first blood. <laughs> so only by the skin of, their, of his uh, lifestealer -y teeth did they make it out of that. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that's fine, and that's time that Sharfik gets a free lane in the middle, because Nature's Prophet got nothing out of that transition. Exactly. They didn't get anything whatsoever. First blood still on the table. Uh, but down bottom, we do see Quokova actually creep skipping past the wave, using one stout shield uh, to try to tank things up and dish out damage. Double damage rune picked up for Ninja's Prophet through a clever use of teleport. But I don't think the creep skip is going to be that effective as, as compared to how it would be against a Clinks or uh, some other uh, random carry oriented uh, safe lane. What we're seeing here is the Lone Druid's Bear can still go for good last hits, has plenty of stout shield to tank up the creeps, and although it's not optimal for him, he's still going to be okay. Yeah, I mean, the fact is, he's getting very good last hits. Both Darkseer and Lone Druid getting the development they need. So Darkseer doing the full creep skip, Lone Druid not even w wanting to fight that, just managing to make sure he gets the farm under the tower, which I think, I, I like this choice, honestly. What do you think of this Nature's Prophet dedicated mid-build with the level and stats? Um, 
That is extremely interesting here because he won't be able to go for teleports nearly as hardcore. His last hits, his right clicks are going to be very, very substantial here at 73 already. Um, but uh, I guess they're really relying on timing and coordinating uh, their cooldowns here. He doesn't want to go for push early, doesn't want to go for trends, just wants to focus on his teleport here. And I think it's great for helping out in this try versus try and reinforcing this uh, what would otherwise, in my mind, be a relatively lost lane. Uh, like we saw, mm -hmm. he contributed a lot, but it also means he's going to take a lot of time. He's not going to be able to directly contest Sharpik, and that's going to allow Sharpik to get off the ground quickly with some major intellect items, and uh, just start bouncing around. We do see up top the Soul Catcher onto Yul. They do get the stun follow-up as well as the Lance. That should be enough damage to First Blood for Alex here, trying to pursue on through. They can switch their target over to Hardeev with Nature's Prophet to go for the Sprout. He does have a Tango immediately, Hardeev getting out, but with that Spirit Lance to slow him down, uh, it's not going to cut it. Oh, it is! Wow, that last right-click, they, they, they didn't even have Vengeance Aura. I'm not even sure, but either way, Alex getting that last right click. I didn't think he had it in him, but 60 damage, getting a yep. high attack roll on that, was, and uh, yeah. able to finish it. It was uh, actually, no, I think regardless, he had 51 HP, and the attack is 58 to 62. Shadow Demon has a pretty tight attack spread, so mm -hmm. it's, sure. damage is decent for an int, actually. Yeah, the biggest issue there is Rubik doesn't have any armor at all, mm -hmm. and when Wave of Terror is active, that's putting it down to actually negative one, which right. is actually amplifying the damage he receives by 6% instead of reducing it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the plus side for rocks is, I mean, Storm Spirit, every time Nature's Prophet leaves, is getting further and further ahead in this middle lane, although actually he doesn't have a much of a last hit advantage or anything for the fact that he spent so much more time in this lane. And the big, big downside for them is, I mean, this aggressive try line has really not worked out so far. I mean, we've got 3-2-2 facing up against 4-3-3, uh, three, three. so the uh, level behind on each of their heroes relative to what Maus is packing in this lane. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, now, Phantom Lancer closing in on that. Oh no, he is actually going to get open wounds up. They get the Sentry Ward out, so Doppelwalk will not save him here. Defensive Disruption does dodge out the Split Earth, so they're going to follow up with the Telekinesis, but will it be enough damage to follow is the question. Lag taking a lot with that Fade Ball, but with that Magic Stick, will survive. Turning around on Yol, tons of damage coming out, and it is enough with that Spirit Lance long range. So they keep him up. Alex, Magic Sticks as well, going to get out, and with this Sprout coming on in, Nature Prophet looking for blood, looking to turn this round in full, and pause. Oh my gosh, these Magic Sticks keeping everybody alive, and nice. with that Three, yeah, turning it around, they they got already had two kills on the board, now up to five. Five zero with that transition, and even a Ren Nature's Call could actually put some pressure on this tower, but either way, the important thing is the Sentries were dropped, the initiation was on Black himself, but because Maus built for the tri lane, they got Magic Six early. Yeah. Look, that really, really helped. I mean, Rubik did have ten charges, but knew he was dead either way, uh, but... Miles is able to, you said, buy the skin of your teeth, and if that, I think this was even closer in all those engagements, in all those different uh, little skirmishes there. Now we do see Sharpik on mid with that ball lightning doing so much damage, and with the remnant, should be able to finish it off no problem at all. Profit sprouting him in, kind of a little cage match there, but <laughs> in the end, Sharpik walks away without so much as but just a little bit, last second aggroing of the tower. So. Yeah. Uh, now we actually almost room. saw Quochko die in bottom, but uh, Lunger didn't get lucky with an entangle, and so Darkseer managed to escape. But I mean, this game so far is the tail of an item, and that item is Magic Stick. If anybody ever asks you if Magic Stick is a good item, like just forward them to this match. Shadow Demon, Phantom Lancer, and Venge would have all died if they hadn't had an abundance of Magic Stick charges just from the fact that it's a three versus three lane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just kind of one of the... a bit of trouble again, Bob, by the way. Uh, yeah, actually getting pinned in just a little bit here. They're going to go for the telekinesis. Should have actually saved that for the surge in technicality, but uh, we'll see if it's enough. The electric vortex to follow. Looking for an entangle, but he's not in attack range. The lone druid just a little bit too far behind, and he's actually just going to walk away from this here. So, yeah, they didn't save their disables for the surge, and instead he got on out, which I feel is a bit of a mistake. I know Sharfik didn't have much mana for overload procs, but yeah, nevertheless, if they had just been able to make it so Dread could get in range, that bear, severe bear, could have possibly gotten that entangle to seal the deal on that kill. Yeah, I agree. I think the timing on the telekinesis was just a little bit off. Alex in a little bit of trouble as well here, but they missed the split earth, and mm -hmm. so that's not going to happen. Dodge nicely. Big Wrath of Nature going to Pross. Black pinning it in and gets Ouch. the last hit. Just quick little right click there. Now looking for damage on Biz, but without any mana, they're not going to get at much opportunity. It's interesting because Nature's Prophet was looking for a teleport over and over and over. He was looking to pincer him in, but just saw, okay, well, he's out in the middle of the river. To send out an easy ultimate, farm a couple creeps, and most importantly, set up that hero kill. So in the end, it's still uh, going the way of Mouse. Six Bottom to one now. Dreaded, and a lot of trouble again.
Oh, big damage coming out. He doesn't get entangled just yet. And with the Sprout actually catching out Quokova, he is able to get out for the moment, but backing back and in, that should be his death. And uh, his bear is actually on cooldown right now. 90 seconds is the bear's cooldown, and that is very, very bad for him. He loses almost all his lane presence based on that lack of a cooldown. So that is as bad as it can get. Nice rage up top from Biz, dodging out the Ventral Spirit's uh, magic missile. But from there, uh, he's still struggling up top. And now that the Lone Druid doesn't have that bear to kind of rubber band him forward, on the bottom lane there, they're going to lose a lot of momentum. Yeah, these, these have been big TPs from Fata. I mean, each, all TPs but one have done quite a lot for him, frankly. I have a question. What do you think? I, this is a decision I find a little bit questionable. Maybe you can justify it for me. Diabolic Edict on the Lushrak. He's level 3 and has one rank of Split Earth, two of Edict. What is that Edict really doing for him? I mean, it's good for pushes, but they're losing mm -hmm. this lane. I mean, I'm not sure if the Edict has actually done all that much. They're they're looking for jungle engages uh, outside of the lane, pretty much like in this situation where the pulling is continuing they want to have a big rumble right around here with the Edict going 100% of the time. If that is the case, Edict is going to do more damage than any other ability he could opt mm. for there. Uh, but it's just uh, right now, he has to be pretty much super pro on his stuns. We've seen a couple of good ones here and there, but we saw how painful it is when you miss it on an easy target like the Shadow Demon in the river. Right. So if you don't rank it up, you're going to be in a bad spot. We do see Sharfit going to be able to get a solo kill on Nature's Prophet, no trouble at all. Uh, the TP comes in for Ventral Spirit. I'm curious if he, they really think they can make this happen. Stun comes out. He does, however, get the last hit. Uh, they try to go and just avoid the vision with the Sprout, and instead he just gets finished off, and uh, there is going to be a quick TP away from Sharfik to keep him up for a free kill. That was definitely a smart TP. I mean, he didn't have the mana to actually tangle with Venge, especially if they ported somebody else over. But, so, good play from Sharfik. I think he's the bright spot for rocks right now, because mm -hmm. this tri-lane is... It's not looking any better now than it did a few minutes ago. I mean, we've got 5-4-4 against 7-6-5. So Black now with a two-level advantage over Booz. Booz is just holding on to those face boots, which is another interesting choice, actually. Again, they're picking very, very aggressive choices. That's an aggressive boot choice for Lifestealer. Versus Black, who's just playing very safe with the Tranquil Boots, the Magic Stick, and uh, I guess he's probably going to move towards Diffusal pretty quickly at this point. Most likely. Uh, but I, I would definitely say that they've pretty well secured this top lane, especially with the participation of Fanta up there. But he's got treads himself. Uh, he's uh, kind of on par with what sharfik has been able to acquire, if not in experience, then definitely in net worth, uh, just right behind there. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's able to get some relevant items and have some high utility. Uh, but he's made such an impact on the top lane that Black is going to be able to transition into the mid to late game, like you were saying with the Diffusal. Uh, compare, kind of juxtaposing that with the issue they're having on bottom, they did get the deny on the the tower, uh, the, I believe the bear was able to accomplish that, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, Quokova has kind of free roaming over this lane, fearless in this regard, because he always knows he has that rank 2 surge, and uh, there's not too much they can do to lock him down uh, when he does pop that off. I mean, we've seen Electric Vortex, Telekinesis, those kind of things come into play, uh, but not nearly as surprisingly when they're always committed to the top. Right. So... For Rock's Kiss, I think they're sort of, right right now what they're doing is actually there is a fight. So yeah. Sharfik is going to try to take two in the middle. But yeah, but the stun actually lands. That's the big issue there. He does get the last hit on Venge, but doesn't have mana. He actually he tries to use a regeneration rune. Is he going to get enough damage here? Oh my gosh, bottling through. He gets the kill on Fata. <laughs> Double kill. I didn't think he could manage it, and he's out of mana, so he probably will die to Alex in the end. Very, very low compensation, though, uh, for what he was able to accomplish there. I was talking about his experience, and now it's shot up to 540 per minute here. But oh my gosh, he was playing so bad. Ballsy there. Of course, going to die at the bottom to no. the entangle. Very, very nice entangle coming out of Dread there. So fortunate that that worked out. And just setting up his bear with good uh, uh, movement speed with the phase boots and now building up towards that armlet to get a bunch of right click presence as well. But yeah, Starfic on the mid. That was mm. impressive. I thought once Eventual Spirit Sun connected, that was it. That would seal the deal because it is ranked up to rank 3. That's a big burst of damage uh, that I didn't think he could handle. But uh, just spamming out that bottle, he finished up the Venge, had good focus. And uh, from there, one versus two was able to turn it around for a two for one. In in the end. Yeah, Sharfik's really gone from being the star player on 3D to, I think, quickly growing into the star player on Roxy. So you sort of look to him to generate the big plays for the team. And two for one plus a tower, I mean, that's a fantastic trade. Booz is perfect, is in a lot of trouble on the top lane. He will mm -hmm. rage, but yeah, he'll rage the scary. missile, and now coming Yol. Okay, Wrath of Nature was something he did not predict. The stun comes out instead of the Leshrac, who also took the hit by the Wrath of Nature, and instead they both dropped down. I thought he could just rage on away, but didn't expect that quick ultimate to just do that much stinking damage. Now, Alex, close 
closing in on Sharfik, just sniping up the rune, and we'll try to walk away. Uh, Sharfik doesn't want to let him go, though, doing so much damage. Even with haste, he can't get out. <laughs> oh my gosh, just, just saying, screw it, just keep on going. And I think the big mistake there was the Shadow Demon trying to get any right clicks or disruption mm -hmm. on the... Uh, I think the big thing was the disruption. If he got the 2.5 second disable, he could have walked away, but uh, committing to that sealed his fate in the end, because Sharfik just too quick on those balls. Going on a PAS, going to be able to burn back. him down. Nice telekinesis. He gets the split earth with the dust already active. Black completely locked down. He is wow. dead as well. Committing the infest. They just turn this around like crazy. Sharfik to start it off, but man, he's going on his killing spree and now putting some points on the board for the rest of the team as well. Great dust, great telekinesis into split earth, and they, they are really, really kind of multitask on their targets. They focus one down uh, with damage while they were disabling the other one to set it up for a follow-up kill. It was really great from Rock's Kiss, and they're able to actually swing this back around to an equal level as far as gold goes and actually take a small experienced lead right now as a rubber banding effect of killing higher level heroes. Right, but it's it, keep in mind that's mostly the Storm of Spirit. I mean, this game right now is all about Sharfik. I mean, he's he's taking his team by the, oh my goodness, and he's on Kochkova in the middle. He might get this kill if he pulls off the electric vortex at a perfect yeah. time. He will. Mm -hmm. Kochkova just uh, in a really bad spot. Thought he could handle farming up I and mean, he's such a durable hero, high base strength, but with only that soul ring to work with here, he just can't stay up and uh, suffering a couple of solo kills repeatedly with the engagement of Pop Biz is going to pop off that rage, try to stay up, but with the Demonic Purge, it should be his death. Now, double Sprout coming on through, or uh, actually sprouting up Rubik. Rubik tries to throw some trees in return, but in the end, <laughs> getting the vision is all they needed to get those last right clicks to finish it off, and look to transition into a push. Uh, they do have Aquila, they can turn it on from black, and uh, from there, try to bring down this tower with a bunch of really uh, lucky juxtaposed procs. He's gotten like four different illusions <laughs> off of only a rank two juxtapose, yeah. so that is really, really effective, and uh, from there, this tower should drop very, very quickly. Speaking of, down at bottom, although uh, there is a lot of damage coming from that Spirit Baron, I'm curious to see uh, how it's going to turn out next. You do see the it Rubik swapping on in. He actually gets swapped right back out, and uh, Hardy taking too much damage. Uh, there is going to be a Telekinesis, but it's not enough to save him here. Okay, he gets the, there, the Lance to finish it off. Black walking away from that Edict damage. Magic Wand in full, but does get stunned up for the moment. Bottom, Black taking way, too also. much, but I think he'll be able to finish it. Turning around with that Lance, he's out of mana, and that is going to be it. Uh, he's going to be able to get one more Lance off unless Biz comes in a little bit too quickly. He does have that uh, W. He's going to try to use it both simultaneously, but a beautiful infest turning into a one for one. He got the Lance off to get the kill on the last rack, but then he was a able to invis only to be dropped down by the AoE. Down on bottom. Hey guys, so this is an interesting opportunity since we are doing a rebroadcast here. I'm going to actually jump back a little bit and give you guys a quick commentary of what happened on bottom lane. Two simultaneous engagements, but uh, uh, one went one way, one went another. And uh, yeah, I'd like to be able to give you guys that perspective real quick. So jumping back just a little bit here, and uh, we'll see exactly what happened. Uh, so, but yeah, pretty much everything happened on top and bottom simultaneously, but I figure why not if I have this opportunity to get this going for you guys. Uh, so pretty much we have that engagement up top in the near future. I'll fast forward to that a little bit here and there. And uh, they go for the push, so on and so forth. You guys just saw that there. And uh, then we'll see what happens after the fact. We do have, he was talking about this invisible nature's prophet coming on down. Kokova here as well. And there is the spirit bear with the armlet with the phase boots. They go in, they TP down, commit the. Yeah, Shadow Demon coming on through. So they go in three versus one, but the bear is wailing away. Slowing down Pokova, but he's still in pursuit. Dread gets vacuum back in. He knows he's going to drop down, but pops off that battle cry, and here comes Sharp Peak, which just turns things around hardcore. Going on, Alex doing a ton of damage here. And Pokova is also taking so much from this bear. Dropping down, looking for one more opportunity, but so far, nothing has been finished off. Pokova hiding in the trees. Alex and the Shadow Demon. Just giving some long range harassment here, but it looks like the Nature Prophet, one more right click, they will both drop down. And that's pretty much what we see as we resume back on in to what we were just looking at. So, interesting opportunity for a quick little instant replay on a different perspective. But then he was a able to invis, only to be dropped down by the AoE. Down on bottom, Shadow Demon picking up a kill on the Storm Spirit. He still got Fata. In a 1 versus 3, he still picked off the Nature's Prophet. But so, it did give away that Mega Kill Streak. Yeah, so it, it, bottom was actually really crazy too. I didn't want to bother you because obviously no, top was it. crazy. But there were two completely separate team fights occurring at the same time. One was three people chasing Lone Druid, who's just very, very tanky at this point. He's the second highest level person on the map. And so he and the bear are running away as fast as they can from the Kochba, uh, Shadow Demon, Alex, and uh, Nature's Prophet team. 
So he's running away, and then Storm Spirit attempts to get in and turn it around with a with a three, the one on three from that point. But Lone Druid dies, and they barely escape. Mao's just managed to sprout Storm Spirit after he ran out of mana to keep blinking around. So uh, Dark Seer escaped with about a, less than 100 HP. Shadow Demon escaped with less than 200 HP, and he just ended up trading off the Nature's Prophet for the um, the Storm Spirit. Nice, nice. Well, there you go. So that was a really, really interesting result. And we do see that it's kind of changing things around a little bit. Sharfik right now has the highest hero level, along with Lone Druid actually mm -hmm. right behind him. So those armlet two are too. so, so strong. And now with the armlet on the bear, that disses out a ton of damage. The current interaction is that he doesn't get the benefit from the strength, but the damage increase, the attack speed increase, and the armor from the passive itself just makes it so he's so darn beefy, so very, very effective at getting quick right clicks off, hopefully for an entangle proc there. Either way, it's a very, very nice item for him, and it's been kind of seeing a lot more activity recently. Right. And uh, Storm Spirit also building towards his Orchid. That's a lot more typical than the, the Armlet Lone Druid is sort of a new thing. Um, I, I first started hearing about it about a month and a half ago. I think Owie was promoting it and some others. But Black is moving towards oh, his Oh, one versus three. Well. Dread is really, really caught out here. And the, with that Demonic Perch, he might be able to be dropped down. But Yol coming in. And Tangle Proc on Alex. Fanta is in the fray here too. But Sharpet comes in from the northern end. Actually gets a nice remnant for Vision. Now bringing down Alex to finish it off. Does get that. Looking for PS, but he gets locked down by that Magic Missile. Stun comes out again onto Fanta, but it's trying to disengage. Yol too slow. He's gonna get dropped and now looking for more. Oh yeah, just leaving for the illusion. Literally doesn't even care enough to actually right click him himself. That that's that's for peasants. He's going in for Hardy. <laughs> looking for more opportunity there. The surge comes out and I think he'll find it, especially with Fata to help him out here. Telekinesis will not stun on Ooh. both of them and instead Hardy locked in and that's a triple kill for Black. Not good. Not good for Roxkus to give a triple kill over to the PL. Good TP in, by the way, to pick up those kills for him. But Dredd just getting caught out. This is like the third time when he's either gotten caught out and just died, or gotten caught out and caused his teammates, especially Storm Spirit, to overcommit to a situation that they don't, they don't know the, the full extent of the danger of. Mm -hmm. And Quokova has that uh, mechanism available. Didn't use it in that engagement, but just feeling uh, a really great position to fight aggressively. We do see Iron Shell up on black. I guess that means I want to go for Roche. They, there's nothing else in that area that would really take effect from that. So they're going to go for the Roche. And again, they have mechanism. They have the Nature's Call coming in, as well as a few others here. Wave of Terror up reduces Roshan's armor down to two, uh, but we'll have to see how quickly they can actually manage as the Radiant are just nearby. Sharfik just has to pop off a remnant from the high ground here to have vision, and they do know. So Remnant will come out. Sharfik will have full vision, and they're going to look to try to get some snipes off right here. Dread coming on in, looking to get it, and instead it goes to both of them, both to the Dire. Now Sharfik Ooh. immediately destroyed with the stuns coming out. Alex does get bursted pretty hard, but nice defensive disruption might keep him up. There is the wall. There is an Infest to actually finish the job on the SD. They have to fall back from here. Hardy taking too much. They cannot run from this. Getting stunned by the Vengeful Spirit. Damage coming into Quokova. He will get swapped out. Nice play, and instead Biz mm -hmm. can't focus him down. Back down here, we do see that the death has gone. To, uh, actually to the left track and trying to finish it off. Nice rage on the magic missile, trying to turn it around once more, but they've been on the back end of this fight the whole time. There isn't take a Brock on the Nature's Prophet. Surge just going to TP out, and here comes Buzz. Defuseled up, no rage available. Magic Wand trying to stay up with those phase boots. Can he get out of here? No TP scroll. He's penned in. They're trying to just flank in and close it on out. There is that pickoff. Nature's Prophet going against Dread, but with that bear to DPS, they're going to be able to finish off the... Nature's Prophet, yeah, Fata it should be dropping down here with the bear last right click to come on out. And Biz is back on in. He feels safe to life steal. The old gets that stun. They're going for black to finish it out, and they actually get the Aegis on the ground. Bear is raring to go to entangle him up once more. Do they have detection? I can't see it right now, so no. They don't. They they, don't. He walks away. But holy crap that fight. Back and forth, back and forth. But one big thing to make sure that you, the viewers realize is that the Dire got the kill, last hit on the Roshan and the Aegis. Black able to walk away with that and uh, still, holy crap that fight. I, I could not believe that fight went as long as it did. That just kept going and going and going. People kept, people kept dying and dying and dying. But the mm -hmm. downside is even though they lose Aegis, you know, Black's still up. He's got that Diffusal, he's got Magic Wand, uh, Tranquils and Ring of Akala, and he can start moving towards Manta or whatever it is that he wants to make next. So, Sharfik, I think just a, a tale of two hype, honestly, in some ways. He got really, really big, he was ahead on levels, but then he just keeps kind of feeding him away. I mean, he doesn't manage to pick up that Aegis Steel, he sort of dies two times trying to bail Dread out of tough situations. And so his impact on the game has really gone down, and his Orchid is going to be substantially delayed as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was at such a great level of momentum, but they've kind of started focusing and counteracting him, and every time that Magic Missile connects, he's in a really bad spot here. Uh, and we saw in the pit that he just got focused down, like, every 
every single person and maybe like three Phantom Lancer illusions just all right clicked him simultaneously <laughs> uh, took away half his health immediately yeah. and followed that up after the stun with his complete death so really it, it was wild what was going on I pretty much Roxas kept on trying to find small windows of opportunity where Mouse wasn't keeping up with one Top another jungle, by the uh, way it's a uh, storm spirit yeah going well. in he's gonna find out Nature's Prophet that it was a Nakes Bomb so infest and the burst damage enough to finish it out now trying to burn things down Black has that mana burn oh, and Ed Sharpik is gonna get locked down here no hope even with that magic wand Hardy does drop a fadeable, but instead gets lanced up, and that might be enough for him to pursue on the next target, especially with that Demonic Purge on the Life Stealer now. That is a steal, but without many mana, it's going to be Yol that actually disengages the fight. Good Goes again. for that good Split Earth, and uh, just showing how effective he can be with that. It is Max Rankin uh, with that Radius, just using it to always, always peel away. And a couple times it has led to his death, just being Spirit Lanced on the back end of it, but he's, generally speaking, been able to make it so that they can fight on the ground on the turf that they want. They can, like, in this last engagement... Uh, down there by the Roche Pit, they went and funneled them up into uh, up above by the high ground here. And uh, they were able to get some damage on in. They got the kill on Fata and so on and so forth. And by spreading them out by, uh, well, I guess they clustered them up, but later on they forced them to spread out to pursue low HP targets. And most of them got away. Tried to turn it around. The end result of that, I didn't really even get a chance to go around to that, was that they almost went one for one. The Roche went to Mouse, but in general, uh, they were able, Mouse got, I think, one more kill. In the, in the end of it. And uh, beyond that, I think the be main benefit there is the experience. That Mouse Sports was so behind him in experience, killing off a level 16 here on a level 15 here right off the bat really helped them out, and uh, they were able to accomplish a lot. Yeah. Hardy going on, Quokova, he has that d demonic purge up against the Surge, but not getting a chance to use it here. He does. Oh, now the bear timing. coming on for the Entangle. And uh, he does actually go Scepter for the moment. He doesn't ha he, he cannot TP out of this, though. Trying to vacuum him down the cliff. Doesn't get the opportunity. Nice wow. blocks by Hardy. Perfect. Perfect steal. Surges the bear... Uh, the druid forward. He pops off that mechanism looking for a TP, but the entangles should come through. No, Kokova! <laughs> Playing his cards, rolling the dice, and over and over and over, that entangle prod doesn't come. 20% with noteworthy, a noteworthy pseudo-random generation. That means every single right-click should have been more and more an entangle. Actually, he got so many out there, but not a single one actually clawed him down. I think entangle is actually not on PRG, by the way. Uh, it's one of the one of the abilities that I, th I don't think it has PRG on it. Okay, I, I thought it, I, I believe yeah. I heard it was, but uh, either way, it's the, the factor is that he didn't get the yep. the improbability of that oh, was yeah. ridiculous, Definitely. one way or another. I mean, especially given how hard he how hard hard he worked for that kill, perfectly timed purge, perfectly timed telekinesis, and a good surge, and it still wasn't enough to actually kill that friggin' darkseer. Mm -hmm. Just walks away. Nelly still does have his arm lit up. Biz is perfect. Trying to actually move in towards a very, very combat-oriented hero. He can dish out a lot of damage. They do smoke up. And they have, the, most importantly, the Orchid up and available mm. for Sharfik. He's going to be able to accomplish a lot with that. And, uh, yeah, Corey just really? kind of delivering his package here as they want to move in to uh, try to gank up aggressively. Here's my issue with the Orchid. And, I mean, Orchid is an amazing item on Storm. It's ideal because he doesn't actually want a big mana pool. He wants a fast regenerating mana pool. And, or and Orchid is the statistically ideal item for that. What I'm worried about is because this Orchid is coming at 24 minutes and not at, like, 16 as we initially thought it might, mm -hmm. I'm really worried about the impact of Diffusal on him. Like, in that last fight, uh oh Biz in trouble top, actually. Black is going for a big fight. Yeah, actually, Black is going to be able to do a lot to Life Stealer. Should get the last right click, but that armlet is keeping him up for the moment. We do see the Nature Robin gets to kill on Rubik, but more importantly, the Life Stealer falls, and that is exactly what we're looking at. Rubik was caught on the back end of that, just trying to help out Biz, but they kind of disengaged, and when they weren't connected together, they couldn't really accomplish much. PAS in a punch. lot of trouble, and with that Orchid to finish it off, Sharfy can just walk away here, but there is a counter Orchid. Uh, Fata does have that available. Vacuums about the Sprout, a little bit to less of an effect, but they get the kill in the end, and that's what's important. Now pushing in on the mid lane, Ion Shell up, Nature's Call up for in 10 seconds, and from there, Kokova will be able to set them up to take down this tower nicely, and I, I definitely agree with what you're talking about with what you're talking about. There's a lot of different item options, uh, but with that Orca now coming up on Nature's Profit, I feel that Sharfik uh, might be paying for his uh, aggressive cost w uh, right. ag with his aggressive choice of that Orchid. It's, he has a well, lot of mana, but... The Orchid's wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's that the fact that he only has it now means that he, he hasn't even started his BKB, and he's gonna have so much trouble against the mana burns, the stuns, the Orchid. I don't know, I worry about whether he's actually going to be able to deliver the same impact. Yeah, one piece of lockdown is all they need. They get an Orchid off that's instantaneous. The Vengeful Spirit has managed to land her stun multiple times over, so PAS on the ball with that. If they can just get that small window where that happens, uh, Sharfik is really, really limited in what he can accomplish. He's great for ganking right now. The Orchid is a utility item that sets up the team for a lot of potential kills, and that's generally what he wants to accomplish. <laughs> Bottom, by the way, uh, Darks are getting locked down by Tangle. 
We'll he tried to um, he tried to vac the bear up to the the ledge, but of course he yeah. can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, can't accomplish that. So kind of negating that invisible barrier right here. So the bear is gonna hang out one way or another. But uh, he has actually gone for Basher on the bear. That's pretty interesting. We do see that uh, the he can do a lot of lockdown on heroes like the Phantom Lancer, on uh, heroes like the Dark Seer is trying to surge out, so on and so forth. So uh, really, Dread is playing the disabling semi carrier right now. Dishes out a lot of damage himself, but the important thing is that he can lock down targets so Life Stealer can stay on. On, even if he's demonic perch, even if he's slowed down to a crawl, the shambling George Romero-esque zombie, he's still <laughs> able to uh, stay on target there and get that damage out, and that's really what he needs to accomplish if he's going to be able to make an impact based on his item decisions of the armlet and soon to be the desolator. I, I like the basher on the lone druid. Uh, he also has hyperstone. Do you think that's Curas or do you think that's Mjolnir? Um, I would say that he's got to go for AC here uh, in this uh, circumstance. It's just like he's, like I said, he's playing a number three role. He wants mm -hmm. to be able to contribute to the fight in a lot of ways. And AC isn't great as a selfish item, so Lifestealer's not really going to want to pick it up. But if they can just get it in general on their team, they can have plenty of armor for themselves to survive against the da reduction that Wave of Terror provides. Mm -hmm. Actually counters it out exactly, five and five. Uh, and from there, they can dish out a lot more damage with right. the AC. Of course, the Hyperstone in general is going to make sure that they they have uh, more reliable bash procs, and uh, they're going to be tangle. able to accomplish more with that. And a tangle, yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think the AC is very strong, but for what it's worth, I mean, number three or not number three, Lone Druid is the only person on the map actually competing with PL for farm. Like, he, he is vastly more farmed than Lifestealer and, and Storm Spirit are. So sooner or later, somebody on this team is going to have to figure out a way of dealing with PL illusions. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to have to fall to the Lone Druid just because of the, the farm equity that we're seeing. And so I don't know if we could see something like a Mjolnir or even a Battle Fury, but I mean, if they don't solve the black puzzle, it's going to be an increasingly difficult issue for them to deal with as yeah. we go into the next five ten minutes. I 100% agree in that respect. I mean, with the Dark Seer's Wall of Replica, even the Disruption Illusions, and on top of that, of course, Black and his army of cat-like warriors, uh, they're raring to go, and I th especially with this Banta style to keep on pr them propagating, I think that they definitely need some kind of way to cleave things down, and generally speaking, Maelstrom is the right pick for that. The issue that I have with that is it seems like that would have been something he wanted to pick up a long time ago mm -hmm. in replace of the... Uh, Sorry, the armlet of Mordigian itself. So by not picking up, by picking up the armlet instead, he gets some nice attack speed, but he lacks that cleave. Yeah. And so it seems like they want to go for a more single ar target oriented focus, where they just try to burst down really hardcore the P main PL while they have vision of him, mm -hmm. and uh, try to fight in that regard. We do see the Roche going to be respawning very, very shortly, and we'll have to see. Yeah, just now came back up yeah. and. I'm curious to see who will jump on that, but one thing to note, three Ghost Scepters, holy crap. They won the, the mm. First it was the Magic Stick, now we're going to have to be calling out Ghost Scepters because this kind of <laughs> thing it can really change the pace of how Lifestealer and Lone Druid act in the middle of an engagement. They have to switch, shift their focus immediately. Yeah, I mean, I think this Roche is Mouses to lose. They're parked near it, they know that they're going to go for it, and they have so much split push threat. I mean, look at this tower, it's already down to 633 HP. Mm. Mouse can just keep pressuring that freely while they spend the rest of their time picking up Roche. And so it's going to have to be incredibly delicate play from Rox to even have a shot at this Roshan. I think most likely they're probably just going to let Mouse have it. They know it's happening, but there's not much they can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gem True Sight on Sharpik, but again, he has to play more cautiously if he's going to be able to make that work, because Orchid instantaneously locks him down, and I think they have easily the damage output to uh, burst him in that short time period. Looks like Black will pick up the Aegis for himself, and from there, doesn't even really need the heart to be considered stable in the next engagement. Even if they have vision with the Gem True Sight, he is still sitting at 1385 HP, and he has two lives to work with here, so I think he's mostly going to be focusing on damage, more uh, offense more than defense, and I think they really has a lot of potential to lock them down. We do, however, see another shift. A demon edge picked up that spear player. Not a sacred relic oh. to go for a, an abyssal blade uh, that he could put on the main druid. No, he goes for a demon edge. MKB, I presume, but what the heck? Interesting. Um, Going on in, the shark yeah. is going to jump on, burst down, pause, really, really quickly, but the damage coming out, the gem on the ground, just completely obliterating Sharpik with a quick focus, and Ghost Scepter's out, PAS still alive, Aegis Prophet will drop down and did counter vacuum, coming on out, that wall doing a lot of damage though, Dread will have to fall back eventually, Alex still up, and Dread is slowed down, he's defusled up, and he's going to have a hard time and disengaging for this, Hardy gets swapped back in through the wall, and both of them drop, full frontal assault coming out of mouse forge spread engaging outside the base and in the end four drop for absolutely nothing not even an aegis yeah i mean that was a disaster honestly i'm proud of them for taking the fight this is only going to get 
tougher and tougher for them, but maybe they should have waited until tier 3 mm -hmm. because they, they were close to winning it, but then just completely overwhelmed, and they're going to pay for it with racks. Yeah, the, the only casualty was the Profit. He bought back, and so that's pretty much all they got out of that. Good focus there, but when Sharfik was locked down, yes, he, I think he had a little bit left on his double damage. Uh, he had a gem, he had an orchid, he was raring to go to focus what he wanted to, but that didn't matter to Mouse Sports. They had so much counter pressure, and even a Rubik vacuum still could they don't have much AoE to follow it. The Split Earth was already on cooldown, so Leshrac did re either reclaim or rebuy a gem, uh, but either way, they have just lost so much out of that as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, this... Sharfy going on in, again. they want Quokova. Or they want Black now, switching it over again. The defensive disruption to kind of bait it out so that Darkseer will walk away. Fata is back in trying to bring down Sharfy. He won't die to the Orca just yet. And with this vacuum, though, his allies will fall by the wayside. Sharfy drops, the Leshrac drops, Rubik falls, and it's just too much. Triple kill for Fata. He comes in at the perfect timing. The vacuum pulls him in through. Wrath of Nature at the perfect angle. And from there, the damage is too much. That is the second game that they lost straight in this best of three series. 2-0. Mass is going to take it yeah I mean I, there's really two things I think that sum up this this series for me one is that one is socio dynamic so rocks are a strong team they've got strong players and they, they played two good games I think in this series they lost two but they didn't play poorly what I think is happening and I think they can work this out with more practice is that you've got two people who are friends who played on two teams together and sort of know each other's style. So that's Sharpik and Dredd. And so especially in this game, you see Dredd sort of gets into trouble. He might stay a bit out. And Sharpik comes immediately in to bail him out. Because they, they have that dynamic. Like, they know how each other plays. Mm -hmm. They know what they're building. They know intuitively what to do. But then you've got three players who don't have that social dynamic between each other. So the other three players, Hardy, uh, Buzz, and... Uh, sorry, I'm blanking. Yul. They have a dynamic, and that works well together as well. And what we see in this game is that those two dynamics don't quite gel. Like, you see sort of Sharfik and Dread doing one thing, and then the other three doing a slightly different, not quite as well aligned thing. And I think that's what they sort of fell prey to in this game. Yeah. So. Oh, the other thing is, uh, Vengeful Spirit. So Mao is like taking a hero who's mostly forgotten except as like a fringe enigma counter and really, really doing work with her, right? Yeah, that's pretty ridiculous how they were able to make it happen every single time. Uh, the the Ventral Spirited Shadow Demon are so similar that I didn't feel that the lane would be as powerful as it was, but we saw how effective it was as long as they had a little bit of HP to work with here mm -hmm. and there. Uh, we're able to dodge on out, get those disables, and really just cause chaos in a 3v3. You generally don't think of it in that circumstance because, you know, 5v5 is where you have to have all your focus as a player, but yeah. at, in a three in those three v threes, they still had to worry about changing their targets frequently. The stuns came out, the disruptions came out, so on and so forth. Yep. And Roxkiss micromanaged that and multitasked that really well when they were on the offensive. But when it was back and forth, when they were half on the defensive at the least, mm -hmm. uh, Mouse Sports generally were the ones who were juking in and out of the trees very effectively, forcing out the disengages and uh, really making it so that their primary damage dealer Black was never really in danger. They made it so that Vengeful Spirit was in a bad spot. He gets initiated on open wounds whatever they pull him out of that position defensive disruption whatever and they keep on playing those little cat and mouse games in the middle of this big brawl and so ventral spirit survives shadow demon survives and the entire time black right clicks away they won the lane easily up there with the nature's profit to supplement that and uh, from there sharfik did a lot but like you said he was moving in he had the oblivion staff he was halfway to that next one and then he started trying to help dread a little too much dread got picked off he went in 1v3, mm -hmm. Sharfik comes in to help, and suddenly they're losing fights. When they start losing that momentum, Storm Spirit stops losing his control on the game. Yeah, they had to snowball, and, and the snowball didn't happen, and they, the, the, the scales just got tipped, and it was Phantom Lancer and Nature's Prophet of Clock, and they just got pushed down. But, I mean, still exciting games, honestly, and two teams that I, I think are both on the way up. I mean, they're playing, they're both on a very strong streak, and they're both doing very, very well, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, that looks like it's going to be it for us for tonight here. Of course, that was a 2-0 win for Mouth Sports in that best of three series. So we thank you guys so much for tuning into it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Again, uh, this has been Blaze and Vikramon. Do you want to plug your stream real quick? Sure. Uh, people can check me out either on Twitch or YouTube. Uh, both are the same. So it's twitch.tv slash Vikramon, V-Y-K-R-O-M-O-N-D. And it's the exact same thing on YouTube. So if you're interested in that, uh, go for that. And then thanks, Blaze, for the opportunity, too. This was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit of chaos, a little, uh, definitely some technical difficulties. Oh yeah, more but... fun for me than you, because you <laughs> have to deal with stuff. <laughs> yeah, sure enough, sure enough. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we can have you on maybe sometime next week, and uh, th thank you guys so, so much for tuning in. Thank you, Vike, for coming on. And uh, if viewers want to check me out, uh, it's going to be twitter.com slash blazecasting. You can follow me there, and I pretty much post whenever I'm going to be casting something there. But either way, it was 
pretty awesome games. It's very, very solid play from a mouse, and I'm happy they were able to d make it place to such great effect and just ha take such convincing wins here. Really, really solid stuff, and uh, good luck to them in the next ones because uh, they're going to need it if they want to move up the rankings here. They 